and um, open up the panel after a little while. So we'll start with Sarah Kane, who's sitting right across from me. And um, can we look at the first image, please? That's controlled behind the scenes. I'm going to call out for the <laughs> images. I don't have a snapper. Um, so the book always starts with a photo of the artist and then goes into the interviews and then uh, shows images as well. But um, next image, please. Sarah has worked um, in abstract uh, painting and making site-specific installations for a long time. In fact, she started by making site-specific work in the late uh, 90s, working in abandoned buildings, and um, nowadays her work also encompasses painting. But she recently, in fact this year, um, installed a fantastic work, a permanent installation at the uh, International Airport in San Francisco. and. Um, it's uh, a work made of glass. Can we have the next image, please, that will show us a little bit of a detail? And the next image, the extensive um, scale of the work. And um, maybe, Sarah, just as a lead into your, into your work, you can tell us a little bit about this experience of creating this. Um, you worked in collaboration with, I think, a local glass manufacturer. Uh, yeah, so this was a two-year process. Um, the piece is actually called We Will Walk Right Up to the Sun. It's 10 feet by 144 feet of stained and fused glass. Um, I did work with a local studio. Um, I had never used glass before, and they had never done a public art commission. Um, also, they had never had a piece that used like basically every type of glass in the shop. So there's like 240 different types of glass in here, as well as like the things that look like tie-dyed are fused, which we made on site. It's sort of like ceramics. You bake it in a kiln. Um, yeah, it was my first public art commission. It's a very long democratic process. Um, and <laughs> you work with tons of different types of people. And I'm so glad it's up. It, Officially, <laughs> <laughs> we're glad it's up too. I can't yeah. wait to see it in person. Um, can we go to the next image? Thank you. This was an installation you did for ICA Los Angeles a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. Uh, a very different caliber of work, of course. It's a mural on a wall. Yeah. Although I don't, I think you don't I like the, the word, word mural. mural. Yes, yeah. I remember. <laughs> uh, yeah. This How do is, you call it? Then? I just say it's a site-specific painting. This is sort of more signature to what I do. It was the inaugural opening of ICALA. Um, I worked with Jamila James, and she just gave me the freedom to just show up and make a huge painting, which is what I like best. Um, I had like, I think I had maybe a week or nine days and a scissor lift. And I, there's some canvases on the wall that were all blank to start. I think there's like eight canvases and then this bench. This is called Now I'm Gonna Tell You Everything, and um, it's a line in a poem that the poet Bernadette Mayer wrote to me. And I bought her a matching bench. So sometimes there's like these conceptual poetic tie-ins. So she had the same bench next to her river where she writes in upstate New York. And there was a tie-in with that. Um, anyway, I could go mm -hmm. on, but. Yeah. <laughs> next image, we have one more for you. It's, I think it's also a wonderful um, shot to show the scale of your work because you are very comfortable in working large and have done so in, in a variety of places like here at the uh, Contemporary Art Museum in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, which uh, I don't know if you can all make it out, how clear it is in the back, but there are mattresses um, in the center of the space. So there was the open invitation to the audience too to interact with the work in the sense of, of uh, lying down, sitting down, contemplation. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah, it's called the Imaginary Architecture of Love. Um, I didn't plan it. It was nine days. It's a 6,000 square foot space and it goes out and hits the external windows too. Um, the mattresses all went to a women's shelter after, but I really like somebody who I collaborated before is George Herms, and he once told me that he just lays on the floor. He, when I met him, he was just sleeping on this little mattress on the ground, and he had my poster in front of it, and he said he would lay there and look at it until he had an idea for inspiration, and then he'd get up. <laughs> and I love the idea of just like laying there until you have inspiration. <laughs> um, so I thought it would be great if you made a painting that you could actually really chill in. Um, and I think in the end you donated the uh, mattresses back to the community, is that right? Yeah, they went to a women's shelter. So a lot okay. of times mm -hmm. there's that sort of Part of the work actually the... goes back into it. Yeah. Okay. Next image, please. Recent commission for Freeze uh, in Los Angeles that was 
looks like a true brownstone, I think, but it wasn't, was it on a... Yeah, it that? was in Paramount's uh, mm -hmm. back lot, so it's a fake New York City brownstone. Um, it's called I Touched a Cactus Flower. It was the section curated by Ali Sabotnik, and that door was there when I went to first do the site visit, so sometimes I leave parts like that. The couch was my studio couch that I painted to move in. There's canvases, and then when you go in and turn the corner, there was a stained glass window. Thank you, Sarah. And then the next artist, next image, please. This is um, Shana Lutger. And next image, please. This is actually a fantastic installation that is up right now for everybody who's based in Los Angeles. It's at uh, Field Matter Los Angeles in uh, their fairly new location. It's called N An Alphabet. And maybe you can just say a few words about the installation, Shana. Yeah, as you can sort of see, um, the, the works in the show are all made of polished steel, so they have a reflective surface. And the space is relatively new, and it was new to me. And, um, you know, there's a bit of brick wall, there's windows, there's um, a lot of noise in the room. And so when I came to the space, I just brought the sculptures and kind of they found their place through the course of installation. There are... Um, there's sort of two rooms to the gallery. So these three pieces share um, the large room with three other works. Um, we can go to the next image. We have a, another view of it. Yeah, yeah, so this is the other half of the room. And so they're all kind of in conversation with each other and reflecting each other. So something that I think about a lot in terms of installation um, is how the viewer moves through the space, but also like the viewer's role in interpreting and reading the works. And so uh, the idea behind this exhibition called An, an Alphabet is, um, and, and an alphabet is an illiterate person, but specifically one who can't recognize the letters of the alphabet. And I just sort of thought about that as um, kind of this potential where if you knew that letters existed, but you didn't know what they were, then you, one might kind of look around and always be looking for letters and not exactly, you might find them in different places. Um, things might feel like they had more meaning. Um, so this idea, again, of just kind of that anything could be a letter. And so I made a collection of shapes that um, felt that way to me, that they could be letters. And um, the, there's also some movement in the show, like this piece on rockers, the, uh, the f sort of face in the net can be moved. It's hanging on the string and it can sort of swing. So things are kind of always changing depending on the light, the viewers, mm -hmm. the sort of which angle you're looking at the work. And of course the, uh, the viewer becomes part of the work because of the reflectiveness and um, um, also, I mean, there's the movement that everybody's supposed to, you know, start rocking the sculpture. Yeah, not, but, don't go rock the sculpture. But the idea <laughs> is that there is this uh, somewhat of um, a possibility of interaction. Yeah, yeah, this kind of potential. Mm -hmm. Can we get to the next image, please? And then this is also an installation that is currently up of, uh, of your work in the context of current um, LA Food, a triennial that's happening. This installation is in North Hollywood Contemporary Museum of Temporary Containers. And this is actually something um, that uh, goes back into your uh, interest into archives and um, also organization of shapes, but brought in the community. You got the containers, I think. These are all throwaway daily use containers that you gathered from the community, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah, so again, the, yeah, the title of the piece, um, the Contemporary Museum of Temporary Containers, and um, the idea was really just to create this archive of clean and empty food and drink containers from the community in this park where I was assigned. So worked there all summer kind of with the teen squad and the senior dance club to collect their containers and from that archive sorted the, them and painted them um, and arranged them in this grid. The fence is about 300 feet long and it spans the park. In a way there's a lot of fence around there and there's a lot of um, garbage, so it feels, I wanted it to kind of feel maybe as if it had always been there. Um, and the, the pieces, they're kind of a, a gradient of lilac and lavender. And so the 
um, lilac and lavender, I did some research on the kind of color psychology and something that stood out to me was that those colors both indicate that they care for others, they put others' needs before their own. And that was something I really wanted to think about, this, like this temporary container that brings us our food, drink, and then afterwards is waste. And so they're also all kind of in the similar color scheme because of, to signify, you know, some go to recycling and some go to the trash, but it's all waste that we're creating through this process of food delivery. So just to kind of I think we have look a, at it. I think we have a couple of other images. Of that. Can we go to the next image, a close up and uh, one more? Yes, my dear. And um, I'll be curious a little later on in the panel to talk about if people are interacting with it, if you have checked on it. But mm -hmm. We can save that a bit. And um, then the next image, please. That's an installation that's um, from about a little less than uh, two years ago. And the next image, please. And this is Franz Siegel here to my, my left. The next image, please. <laughs> this is um, an interesting uh, piece that you actually created in Ecuador at um, uh, a very old church. And um, the work is basically inspired by the place, but also references it. And, then it needs to be seen in the place that it's a part of. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that because it's a nice lead-in into, into your work, friend. Um, I guess, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this was done in the oldest cathedral um, in Cuenca, and it was part of the um, Cuenca Biennale. Uh, it's, a, it's an older piece, um, but actually what I was interested in at this time, which I'm still really interested in, is this idea of what can be extracted from a place um, that we all go to different places and if we were to investigate um, what's underneath or what is connected with that place, how that could show up in the visual. So in this case, um, the cathedral had three basic different types of stones. One was Inca as the foundation. Um, then there was the colonial stone, which is on top of that. And then there were also the river stones. And each of those three stones had completely different significance and also different time period and a uh, different idea about power relationship. Um, and so that was something that I tried to explore in this piece. There's a wall that you can't see that is opposite the suspended piece. And the suspended piece is basically a ghost of that wall that um, that shows up as a subtraction. And so the idea was really to create this ephemeral form that changed as the light changed throughout the day and, um, and also address some of these um, issues of ancestry that was in this place that were not um, readily available at first sight. And you also interacted with this particular place in the sense that you filled the water basin that is not something that is usually uh, filled with water. Right, and yeah. then I floated elements, um, reflective elements in the water mm -hmm. um, so that it also changed, um, you know, it was almost like a cinematic piece without the cinema. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. And the next image, please. Um, this is a project that I did for um, PST LALA, -LA, and it was um, where I uh, went to Brazil and I worked um, over a two year period in a Fulbright um, to do research on, also on location and the idea of how the landscape there and specifically different um, plants were surrogates for the homeland. So especially in terms of Afro-Brazilian landscape and Afro-Brazilian religion, there the um, each leaf is a significant um, surrogate to another place and also to the representation of people. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to explore that in this um, installation, mainly using drawing as a way to connect this history um, and to uncover it. Um, and thinking about how shadow um, drawing as uh, a drawn element and also um, relief, three-dimensional relief, uh, that becomes a physical kind of space, how those three things can talk about um, the ideas in a different way. 
And um, we're going to go through some of the images. We don't have time to yeah. talk about every single one. This is the same uh, work. And we can go to the next image. Um, what I want to point out here is that this is basically a double drawing. You can walk in between them. So you can have different vantage points where it either looks like a flat piece or you can experience two layers and, um, of course, look from, you know, from behind the work as well. But again, there's this kind of idea of bringing the audience in and maybe even choreographing um, a certain movement in the room. And also documenting a place and then reinserting it into another space. So mm -hmm. I actually like that tension and interaction mm -hmm. of like two different sites, one being the site that's being investigated and the other is the exhibition mm -hmm. site. Next. Oh. Um, it's yeah, and it's actually the first time somebody actually used the skylight in that space. Yeah. And next image, please. Oh, and that's just this is something that I'm working on mm -hmm. now, which is actually um, tracing the lineage of several um, porcelain and how it began um, thinking about Iran and China and how all of mm -hmm. these other places sort of feed into. Um, the lineage of pattern mm -hmm. um, and and the landscape, mm -hmm. um, how pattern is derived from the landscape. And the next image? Oh. This is at uh, LA Louvre, so that was an installation that was in town where you kind of uh, had a work come um, in and out of the building, basically. Using the window mm -hmm. and thinking about a dispersed uh, drawing instead of something that was whole, so okay. working inside and right. outside the space. Okay, and the next image, now we come to Diana Thater. And the next image, please. Who's been a, a pioneer of film and video art um, since the 90s. And um, her work in, involves uh, fantastic, immersive installations where the viewer is really entering a space and um, becomes part of the world in the sense that they're standing inside of it. You really enter Diana's work, especially in this piece, China, which uh, uh, involved two wolves. But maybe, Diana, you can uh, talk a little bit about this piece. Was this the first one that was uh, truly immersive? Yes, it was. Um, yeah, this is a six projector video installation that I made originally for the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago. It's six projectors and a 360 degree installation that sort of stars two trained wolves, one of whom was named China, so the piece is named for her. And we can maybe go to the next, yeah, next slide. Image. This is the same piece installed at LACMA for my retrospective, which happened in 2016. And you can see uh, the wolves in the piece. You can see that the piece is broken down into the primary and secondary colors of the video band. Um, a number of things. It's a lot to explain, but that's basically what it is. But it's, it's true. I mean, your work changes with a, a particular location, but you have certain parameters of how uh, a work, what a work needs at least, or uh, the yes. most it should Yes, I have. mean, with a piece like China, it has to be a certain size. Um, but it can be installed in different rooms, different spaces, and different kinds of spaces, but it needs to have certain uh, things in place. Mm -hmm. And one of those things is, of course, the size of the room. Right. Uh, next image, please. And this, this is the work Delphine, mm -hmm. yeah. This is a piece called Delphine. I made this originally for the Vienna Secession um, in 2000. The piece, I, I made it in 1999, but it was installed in 2000. This is a four projector video installation that also includes a video wall. I made this in the Caribbean with a pod of wild uh, Atlantic spotted dolphin. And the two images on the video walls that you see are images of the sun shot by a NASA telescope that's in orbit around the sun, photographing it continuously. And so just to you know, give you an idea, again, if you go into the space, you're surrounded by them, you're looking up at them, it's almost you have this kind of very intimate um, experience of watching the dolphins from within their uh, world. So you're not looking at mm -hmm. them as objects, but they become kind of subjects to interact with. Mm -hmm. And I think that is part of your uh, big concern to break that barrier. Yes, yes. And the next image, please. 
Um, this is knots and surfaces. This was, was originally installed at DIA in New York from 2001 to 2003. It's a piece that I made with honeybees um, and an entomologist at UC Davis. It's five projectors and one video wall. And the images that you see are all shaped images. And that's the first time I ever did that in my work, which was to take away the video rectangle and leave the images uh, as hexagons or make it appear as if the images are hexagons. And uh, I would just before we start to open up the conversation, like to show the trailer that you made for the LACMA mid-career retrospective you had. It um, kind of uh, shows snippets of your work, but since you're moving, you're working with a moving image, mm -hmm. it'd be nice to show that if, if we could yeah, screen that this, for a second would be nice. This is a trailer that I made for LACMA for my show. And it showed in the movie theater before films in the Bing Theater. Um, our technical staff is behind us, so it's very. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, it'll take <laughs> no, a minute. <laughs> but it showed before, you know, LACMA has movies all week, and this showed before the films. the last image, you know, this kind of uh, domination of another creature leads me to my first, I have loose chapters in my, in my head for our conversation, but what I want to talk about first is um, control. Control when working uh, site-specific, uh, site-specifically you're giving it up. There's a component to the work that you are um, not able to control, which is the way it's being experienced by someone, how they interact with it. And um, that's my first open question to all four of you. How do you deal with it? I mean, it's certainly very different um, creating a drawing, a sculpture, a painting, to having a work that feeds of the space, but also from um, feeds off of uh, the interaction between work and audience. Well, I think for, for my work, I try to incorporate things that are um, unpredictable, wild animals, <laughs> and architecture that I don't choose but am given. So I'm really interested in working with things that are unpredictable or unknown. That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. But one that you embrace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a challenge that it's inspiring, yeah. or is it a, a, a no, thing you no, have to put up with? That's what I'm always looking for, yeah. is let's go see elephants and let's see what they do, you know, and then let's go to this place XYZ and install it and see what happens. It's all very, you know, making, I'm making the work, and I think maybe all of us are, making the work from the moment I think of it till it's done, till the installation is done. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, maybe I only make one or two pieces a year because it's from the moment I think of it until that installation is done. That's how long it takes to make a piece. Mm -hmm. How's it feeling? I would say just in terms of the form, like instead of 
control really thinking about the form itself, like that the form doesn't manifest itself until the information is gathered. So um, I am a particle person where I'm constructing something and I don't know where the edges are until that, um, until I've got the information. Yeah, the, the concept of control, there's, I mean, I'm responding to what Diana said in that part of, like, the, the thing that we set out as artists is to, like, have a situation and navigate that situation and the parameters of that situation. So we always want some kind of barrier to contend with, whether it be the unpredictable wild animal or the architecture of a space. And then I think this leads into your question too, which was also about what happens after, right? Like the audience and what did, how do they interact once it's finished and we, in a way, lose control um, of some things, you know? And I think that, um, again, yeah, that, that finding those borders or the edges are part of the process and like you need to have some of these containers and obstacles in order to feel challenged. Um, and I think, you know, what happened, I think a lot about the audience's interaction when I don't have control or how do I control the audience and the viewer with the work and with the way they move through the work, you know, so. Do you even have a clear image of the audience when you create a work like that, Sarah? How is it for you? Do you try to envision in a public setting who the people might be who are um, ultimately benefiting from the work? I keep it in mind, and I definitely, I think I approach the space thinking about how people are going to enter it and leave it. Um, but for me, I started making works on site to let go of control. My work goes back and forth between control and abandon, and I don't plan them and it's a very intense like compressed two weeks and whatever happens happens um, so for me the whole point of working site specifically is to be present and to create a space where the viewer then is more present with the work would you say that you have to um, be rather self-aware settled in your language secure in your language before you can get to that step opening the work up to this kind of open factor that you do not know how to uh, <laughs> anticipate? I mean, I, it, I would imagine that it takes some, um, you know, self-assurance to allow for this kind of outside question mark to be a part of, of your practice. A, cer a certain set of tools, I think. Um, you know, actually I was thinking though, well, first of all, a certain set of tools that, or like a methodology that you might use or fall back on. Um, and then maybe a new methodology that, that happens because of the place. But I was also thinking about how maybe part two of your question is like, what if the work is relocated to some other place and what, like, what kind of pressure does that put? Because you've both, actually probably all three, have had situations where that has happened or? What was that like? Can you talk about that? Um. I mean, I, I do think that works are made in, you know, the, let's call it like the first installation of a work. You're, and I, I often think about being site responsive. So I, I'm, anything that I make, even if it's a sculpture that is contained, it's still kind of its position, it, where it sits in the room, how it's, which way it's facing is, thinking about the site and kind of responding to the site and how a viewer might move through the site. So yeah, that changes in the next installation. You have to um, adapt that. So I would, I always think like the next installation might be different because you'll have to adapt to new space. And that's sort of what you were saying with, you know, there's certain parameters that are, that need to be, um, that are requirements, but then the rest you gotta kind of figure it out again and make it look good and work at the space. Do you write these um, requirements up? I mean, do you kind of oh. set that very clearly yeah, in absolutely. writing? absolutely, you have to. I write installation manuals for every piece I make, and you, have, you absolutely have to. The interesting thing is that when I first started working, 
I understood that I needed to make these installation manuals, and so I made a kind of informal study of how artists had done that, and I came to MOCA, and I met with John Bauscher, who was the head of installation, and he showed me uh, installation instructions from Nauman, from Rauschenberg, from Barry Lavaugh, from all of these artists, and how, how uh, installations are, uh, how they're put up and what are the parameters. So I made this kind of study of them and then I figured out how to make my own. Mm -hmm. But MOCA was sort of, <laughs> the re that's the reason I mentioned cool part it. Of that. Yeah. yeah. How's that for you, Sarah? I mean, you um, often have to take your work down, Yeah, correct? usually it's dead once it's done, but um, I want to see a book of that. <laughs> <laughs> that I know, amazing. that would be a great, <laughs> I was just thinking, um, an archive, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But the San Francisco thing was the first piece I ever planned and worked with a fabricator. And it was because I, I made a book of three years, like 10 or 15 works on site. And it really bummed me out that they're all gone, even though I, like, I love that too. So I'm trying to make more permanent works, but they're different. They're not the same as the works on site when it's painting. But. You know, there's something but you good work a lot with improvisation, right? You allow yeah. yourself to really show up on site and uh, yeah. I mean, back to your come question a minute ago. I think in order to do that, this, you just have to be okay with failing. And I hope mm -hmm. I don't fail, but I'm okay with it if I do. Mm -hmm. I was thinking too about um, a kind of um, cultural reinsertion as well. Like if you, let's say, do um, a study of something like even the Brazil project and then that gets inserted into another context here. Um, or thinking like um, at one point I had organized um, a show that was about when I was living in New York about New York um, light and space and it um, came here to LA and the review of it here was through light and space perspective that was so opposite to actually what it was about so also thinking about like the shift in context with with all of that seems really interesting to me like it's a place that I personally really like to explore that like uncomfortable um, place of that especially culturally like where it doesn't quite um, fit in yeah. Do you have fantasies, all of you, of a particular context that you have not explored? I mean, you have shown to Western audiences, institutional Western audiences, um, but are there places that you would love to insert work into and see what the responses would be? Or is it just project to project that just grows naturally? That's <laughs> just project to project. Yeah. I don't but have I mean, any. For you, Diana, you, would you love to, for example, bring um, your work to a place in, in Africa where some of the, uh, um, you know... No, it's not necessary, and I don't think about it. But I think, oh, you know, I'd love to work in a round room. But I don't have thoughts beyond that sort so of dumb idea, uh -huh. you know. But More architecturally. You, you're disappointed if you have a fantasy about a space and you're just, then you're just disappointed. So yeah. I think I try not to. Okay. I have some disappointments. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more. No. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about, um, again, harkening back to the audience because that's such a crucial part of site-specific work, but choreographing movement. Do you give much thought to how someone walks through a particular work or goes from room to room um, that can be in a one-room installation? Or in uh, your case, you obviously, with a mid-career survey, you're working with multiple rooms, but... Yeah, I mean, that, the, working that way, you see, when I install a show like that that has multiple pieces in it and has more than one room or has several rooms involved or a number of rooms, the doorways become very important, and the vistas, and the layout of the show is crucial. So when I did the LACMA show, we worked on the architecture, but simultaneously we worked on the layout of installations, and then all the while I keep in mind these vistas through doorways, these views, because other because I have color in every room, I have images moving, and you don't want people to be 
just overwhelmed by a kind of cacophony of, of images. You, you know? want to lead them yet not lose them. What's and that? You want to lead them but not lose them, exactly, not overwhelm them either. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And lead so them it's very theatrical space. in that sense. It's I mean, yeah. tremendously theatrical. Mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. use the word choreography, which is mm-hmm. the word I use all the time. Mm-hmm. You have to choreograph the motion of the work for, it, for me, because I'm working in, with moving images, the motion of the work and the motion of a viewer, someone walking, you know, while a dolphin is, you know, spinning mm-hmm. or something. You want to be able to envision what that might look like. Mm-hmm. I think, too, about slowing people down, you know, in, mm-hmm. in, for me, drawing does that, like the idea of a medium kind of getting in between the information, um, you know, so that somebody can look in a slightly different way or see something up close versus seeing um, an overall image. Um, You know, I think that that is, especially like in LA where you're driving to exhibitions instead of walking like that in itself, I found myself actually, um, you know, getting out of the car and (laughs) my... It's a ritual. to ha- it, yeah. Yeah, but also like having to take a moment so that I can actually get into work that is slow. Um, I think that's really important. But you know, when we're in, you know, like the Instagrammable moment, I think that the slowing down moment becomes potentially a radical position, mm-hmm. or at least I would like to think that. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot about this kind of slowing down and a pause, like a pause, kind of. And, and how to make something that causes people to pause and why do I pause? And, and that's kind of, it often is hard to articulate, but this kind of, uh, you know, just to stop for a minute. Um, and with the public artwork that's up now in North Hollywood, that was, I had to think a lot about how people move through that space um, and a lot about how what kind of effect I wanted to have on that. And, and my kind of approach to that work was to be um, very accommodating. I didn't want to show up and kind of make the park uh, inaccessible or unusable. I didn't want to interrupt the normal flow through the park. I wanted the piece to feel as if it was maybe always there, as I said earlier, and, and kind of a... Um, I wanted the community to look at it and and to like it. <laughs> you know, like I didn't want to be an, an a kind of imposter. And it took a lot of work um, to get there. And I spent a lot of time there. Um, and also just installing. I knew I wanted to have this like 300 foot arc. And when we went to install, I realized there had to be breaks in the fence. Um, so that people could walk through because I could see how people were kind of cutting across this field and if I hadn't had the break they would have had to walk all the way around and so we put the breaks even though it kind of interrupted the piece as a way to kind of just be a little more I don't know you know blending in have you been able to talk to people experiencing the work? I mean, is there a converse, is it a, a basically a touchstone for conversations since you have this yeah. particular space? Yeah, I mean, installing the work took um, about a week on site. And just during that process, so many people kind of came up to us and expressed their, they only, I only had positive feedback. I'm sure there is negative feedback as well. I've only received positive feedback, but that, um, just the way that the color, people really appreciated that it wasn't, um, it was kind of, you don't, in, the, this color lilac and lavender, it's not that it's not from nature, but it it kind of both blends in, um, that it more reflects the color of the sky at different times of day, but it's not um, jarring. It's not like how hot pink and uh, green and different colors would feel. I thought. I wanted it to, again, be hospitable. I like the sort, um, and uh, and to blend. So there's gr- there's the green lawn. There's a lot of concrete. Um, it's also a sculpture that you drive by. So a lot of people kind of encounter it, and I see them kind of slowing down, and you can kind of get it from that uh, per- point of view. 
And then if you're walking, you get a different kind of point of view and there's signs and then there's a whole kind of didactic text. So it was also important that it be accessible on all these different levels, that it was um, able to be understood from the car, <laughs> from the sidewalk and from up close. I want to um, pick up a word that Fran just threw out, Instagrammable moment. And um, documentation is obviously very important when you um, create site-specific works that come down at a certain point, and in Sarah's case, have even come down and yeah. just been destroyed. How do you deal with that? Is, I mean, do you simply try to have uh, regular photographs, or do you try to capture it in a way that gives an impression of what it was like? I mean, it's a little bit different than just photographing something heads-on. Do you try um, a, maybe well, to film it? It's what I think about the most when you were talking about the viewer. I think about the doorways and the vistas, but also I'm always thinking documentation afterlife. Um, and I did this work on site at uh, Orange County Museum in 2008, and I had a filmmaker friend, Aza Jacobs, look at it and he and I had never had a filmmaker look at my work and he started framing it out like a film and it was a real sort of eye-opening moment where I realized oh I need to think more about this because all the and also that was a moment where like everything was going digital so now outside we were just talking about I actually like the documentation of your solo show <laughs> um, but we were talking about the necessity of it and I'm always there, like I just flew up to SF and I flew my own photographer um, who I love and we work together really well. And if I, for some reason, if it's like Europe and I have to leave early, I take all these photos first and send it to them. Um, it's essential, I think. How about you, Fran? Your work is very elaborate and layered. It's hard to get it from a flat image. Yeah, I don't think I've done so well in that department actually I mean part of it is because um, the the work is quite layered and deals with light so often the photographs that I take um, you know over time are the ones that are maybe the most important but they're like the least professional so I haven't quite um, gotten there yet actually and we were talking before about this idea of documentation in a um, sort of accurate way, but that doesn't communicate the experience of the work, and I think that's probably the hardest to figure out, so, yeah. I mean, I had somebody recently made a film of my process, and actually I think that that is maybe the most interesting because it talks about the way of making the work as opposed to even what it is you're looking at, but mm -hmm. why it's there, so. Diana, how do you think about that? Is it, uh, are you thinking about archiving, You've, especially since you had a mark like a mid-career um, survey, which is a particular milestone? Yeah, I think since I first started working, because when I started making this sort of large-scale installation work, a lot of people weren't working that way in video. And so I had to think about not only the history of it, but you know, how should it be documented? How should it be archived? I've always, always, always cared about that aspect of the work is, you know, the installation manuals and the photography. And I have my photographers um, with whom I work very, very closely. I have one in Europe and two in the United States. So I'm always flying my photographers around or my galleries are or the museums are to actually photograph the work. Mm -hmm. So most of the photos you saw of mine were shot by Frederick Nilsson mm -hmm. and, uh, and the, one, the European ones were shot by Roman Mensing and those are my two photographers who I work with really closely. And they understand what the work is and mm -hmm. a lot of people who shoot photography don't understand moving images mm -hmm. and how to actually right. capture something to make it look as if it's moving or mm -hmm. to, to let you know that this thing moves. Mm -hmm. It's not easy to do. Right. I think that's good advice for younger artists also, how crucial that part is. Yeah. You know, you're um, probably excited to just have something up, but that that's really something you need to pay as much attention since when it comes down, yeah. it's not a drawing. You can pull out the flat files and, and show someone easily. Well, I think, you know, it, say for me, I only ever see my work when I put it up, so I never get to live with it. 
so a painter could live with her work, a sculptor could live with her work in a way that I can't. It only exists when I put it up. So documentation is really important to me, you know, so that I can look back at what I've done, and that's the only thing I have. And I also shoot lots and lots of video, but it's for me as well. Do you ever go back looking at such uh, documentary photographs, any one of you, and, and um, think years later, this needs to be revised, let me go back into that work? Or let me do a similar installation, but let's take it into a different direction? I, I do think there's certain um, installations and exhibitions that I return to and think, like, okay, that worked that still is working for me. What mm -hmm. can I learn from that? Um, and, and what is it that's working and how can I carry that forward? Or what am I interested in that is working? And sometimes that changes. Something that feels like it was working and I kind of try to think about what it was working and I apply that again to another piece. It may work, it might not work and what attracts me changes over time as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, yeah, I think that in, in this current um, installation and an alphabet, I was thinking about a body of work from 2010 that I was, that was kind of had resurfaced and was interesting to me again. And I thought about that a lot. The HYST, the hysterical work. So yeah, it kind of came back and a lot of the themes are still present and still kind of at the core of my work. So. Sarah, how about you? I think I do that more in painting because I also have a daily painting studio practice. Um, but also, I, I kind of love that we all just ignored Instagram, but I would like to say I sort of think it's garbage and <laughs> I'm not on social media. And I think once you put your artwork out there, you don't even fucking own it anymore and you have no control over it. So I think it's just a lot of problems and I ignore that side of the world. Mm -hmm. I use Instagram. I use Instagram for a very specific reason. I don't. I'm not on it or anything, but I use it <laughs> to spy like <laughs> on museums where my work is installed. Uh -huh. So if you go to Instagram and you look yourself up, you can see your work and you can see what people have photographed, and I can see what the museum is doing. Mm -hmm. Like I can see that they put a bench in the middle of my piece. <laughs> and then I call and start screaming, Watch or I can out. see that yeah. one of the projectors yeah. is off. So I use it to spy, basically, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I would say that I don't um, really like this idea of revisiting so much as, um, you know, maybe this idea of um, using a, a methodology or maybe um, revisiting like an overall thematic Thing that like needs further investigation, but it wouldn't necessarily be like a material or or a way that I did something. At least for now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to uh, bring the panel back to to the book towards the end before we open it up for the Q and A. And um, I thought uh, questions the the book. Uh, talks about works that are on display in the studio while we um, um, have a conversation or particular projects. So there's a lot of specific questions, but ever so often there's a little bit of a, um, a broader uh, a question. And I thought it would be fun to ask each one of you something that um, I asked someone else in the book. So let me just get, since I'm going to read those out um, to you, if you engage me. Uh, so I'll start with Sarah. And it's a question that I originally in the book asked uh, a friend, but Sarah, I would like to ask you, um, do you think of your work as corresponding with a particular place where they are shown? Is it a, what I meant by that is, is it a correspondence, is it a kind of a relationship, or is it um, something that you um, basically insert into a space? No, it's all about the place. I mean, even the paintings that aren't site specific, I make in bodies and then I always think of them as, oh, that's the London show. Or, um, but with the works on site, it's totally about the space. I usually don't know what's going to happen until I'm in the space. Um, and I've always sort of worked like that. And it, in the beginning, it was out of necessity. I couldn't afford to have a studio, so I would just go to these spaces that were empty and take them over. Um, and there's like 
no way to ignore like a rat infested dirty building, <laughs> you know, but it brings a lot to the work. And um, Shauna, I have a question for you that I originally uh, asked Diana. Have any of your works changed in meaning for you over time? Um, I've, I've, I'm going to assume the answer is yes, but I haven't. Um, I don't have a specific example, but I can say my experience in relation to that question is more that works, uh, I'll discover things about the works afterwards that I didn't necessarily know were in the work when I was making it. Um, and again, I, just a silly example, it's not silly, it's very personally meaningful, but no, the, with the installation that's up now at Vielmetter um, called An Analphabet, and I was thinking about this illiterate and, and the shapes of letters and going through my archive and blah, blah, blah. Well, I also have a two-year-old, and so she is <laughs> An Analphabet, and of course, like, that was pointed out to me a bit during, pretty late in the process of working at that show, so it's like, oh. Right. <laughs> so that happens. Yeah. And Fran, a question that uh, I posed to Sarah originally. Um, how do you decide what to work on each day? Is it a spontaneous or premeditated uh, decision? This was something when we talked about um, studio practice. Um, so I have uh, usually different projects that I'm working on at one time. Uh, and just for example, like now I'm working on a metro project and it might be that a certain deadline is coming up and that's like the day's activities. But my favorite thing is actually to have no, um, no deadlines and to be the tinkerer that I am. So I love, you know, I get up quite early and I like to see the transition from night to day and I like to really play around um, in a way where I'm moving things all around and so on in the studio. And that usually yields um, an idea which then gets built into a project. And if it's a project, like then there's another kind of deadline which might be a show or another kind of deadline which might be like an overall project that has like multiple parts to it. Um, sometimes I have to compartmentalize things where I'm compartmentalizing a week or a day and I have this schedule and so on. But mostly I really love this open-ended tinkering time. Um, so, and that really has no boundaries, so, yeah. And um, Diana, a question that I had asked Shauna is, um, is it more comfortable to use a space that you know well, or is it more inspiring to use a space um, that you've never worked with before? Oh, I think I've said a little bit about that mm -hmm. already, but yeah, I mean, I guess comfortable is boring. You know, I mean, when you have a gallery, you know, they have their space for X number of years, and you install in it one, mm -hmm. two, three times. Mm -hmm. By the third time you're installing, you know, in your gallery in New York or in LA or wherever, it's boring, mm -hmm. and you, you know, no, you want the, ch I want the challenge of interesting architecture. And because of my work, because it has been shown in interesting architecture, people with interesting architecture call me. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm, mm -hmm. that's what I want. Would you say, just as a follow-up question, that um, the architecture, the site, completes the work in your case? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I wouldn't put it that way. I mean, I see the work as a sort of collaborative effort between the artwork, the viewer, the architecture. You know, it's, it takes all of those things, all of those ingredients need to be present for the work to actually work. Um, I would like at this point to open uh, the panel up to the audience, if anybody is uh, dying to ask us something. Should we use my microphone for that, Christy? What do you think? I think you could ask me directly. Okay, okay. Don't be shy. Oh, come up. <laughs> Don't be shy. Come on up. Is there more? No, I just had a question. I pulling it.
Mm. So I'm curious about the degree to which each of you had to interact with communities and in what different ways and how that becomes a factor. Um, did everybody hear the question? Yeah. No. The question was, and to what extent have you um, interacted with communities in your work? In yeah. a nutshell, it was, it was nicely formulated and much longer. Yeah, I think um, another part of the question was sort of how, how do communities or the community at the site in influence what site specificity is? And I can talk a little bit about the North Hollywood project. Um, and you know, it's part of this uh, tri triennial current LA food citywide um, temporary public art project that's up now. And I really, um, and there, there's a mandate from the city that it needs to engage with the community. And I um, really thought about that and, and how to kind of do that in a somewhat organic or natural or kind of way that worked for everyone. And I talked about that a little bit with the installation, but it also meant that in the, I, the work is a portrait of the community in that it is the food containers from that community and their containers look different than my containers and it's really true and I, I mean so I it, when they see the work they can see like their pizza boxes or their <laughs> container and and feel that and it also meant that there was about two months of engagement working before the piece was made over the summer where I was there, me or my assistant were there two or three times a week to kind of talk with people and explain the project and meet with families at the summer festival and this and that. So, so this work um, developed hopefully with some specificity and out of dialogue with the people that were there and it's only made possible by the people who chose to participate by bringing their containers to us. Um, there's nothing from me there, it's all kind of from the place. And, and I would say like in terms of the Metro um, Commission, that's really um, also like a part of the project and the mandate and um, you know, meeting with different um, facets of the community um, and also sort of, I mean for me, like finding out what the site was also meant talking to people who lived there to find out what the site was. Because I think that, um, especially when I've done projects in other places, like there's a difference between being a tourist to a place and showing up and, you know, wanting to make a project about this place, um, you know, and not knowing uh, enough or or not knowing what the people who live there know more about. So I'm in my work, even though I try to put myself in. Um, situations that I do know nothing about. I try to be um, sensitive and um, and informed about what it is I'm working with. But that's a very um, like tenuous balance, I think, that I've tried to um, explore. Yeah. Um, anytime you're painting outside in the public, <laughs> you cannot avoid the community. Um, I did a land. Los Angeles Nomadic Division. I did their exterior at uh, Santa Monica and Highland, which is one of the craziest corners in West Hollywood. Um, and the piece was called, Hey Babe, Take a Walk on the Wild Side. And there's a lot of trans prostitution there. And a lot of the ladies came up and told me like, this is amazing, you captured the corner. Or, and like these homeless kids came up to me and said, or I don't, I don't know if they were totally homeless, but I think they were. And they said like, it made them so happy to be able to look at it every day. Somebody added a pink stiletto to the roof. Um, so there's always, and the same with ICA, it's across from the Greyhound. Uh, a lot of, uh, this one homeless guy watched me every day paint, and he would say, could you add a dolphin? <laughs> like, you know, and you talk to them. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we collaborate. Diana, have you ever um, considered having an outdoor uh, installation projections on buildings from the outside? Yeah, I mean, I've done that. I did that in Chicago last fall. They did the largest like video projection in the world. It was probably the biggest for a half a minute till something in Singapore <laughs> got bigger, you know. But, and that was a fiasco. I loved doing it, but it was a total fiasco. And people want me to work outside all the time, and I don't want to because it's impossible. You can't control it. 
and especially with video, you can't put video for the most part outside unless you're going to use giant video screens. And no one has offered me Times Square yet. So the Guggenheim um, has, though. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to yeah. add one thing, though, that from an earlier question that actually applies to now that. Um, in Cuenca, I did three installations, and one of them was outside, and it was in the center of this town. It was a suspended piece, and a lot of people didn't know it was art at all, and I really loved that, that like people could sort of walk into this um, square and wonder what this piece was and sort of be interested in the phenomenon of it more than, um, you know, that it was it was an artwork for an exhibition. So that's something that I like strive for. That's the ideal scenario. Any further questions? Oh, the, the last sentence of the trailer. Oh, in the trailer, the text, it says, all have won and, and all deserve prizes. It's from Alice in Wonderland. And it's from an installation I made in 1999 that MoCA actually owns. It's called the Caucus Race. And the whole thing is taken from a chapter in Alice in Wonderland. And so it goes from screen to screen. There's animals on all the screens. And... Um, uh, it, and in the end, it's a race between the animals in Alice in Wonderland. And in the end, all the animals win. They ask the dodo, who won? Who won? And he says, everybody has won and all must have prizes. And so that's kind of how I feel about art. Everybody wins. Everybody gets a prize. <laughs> Everything I do, yeah. Do you want to repeat that, Stephanie? Yes, yeah, so the, the question is, what is it about animals? Your work, <laughs> <laughs> not exclusively, but predominantly, I features know. animals, uh, I don't threatened know. species. I, mm -hmm. I like, I wanted to work, when I first began working, I wanted to work with this, with simul simultaneously with a lot of control and no control. And we talked about control earlier. A lot of control is controlling the camera setup, controlling how everything is filmed, how it's edited, how it's installed. And the uncontrollable thing is the animal. And that's always what I want. I don't want to know what's going to happen. And I can't have a fantasy about what will happen because it won't. You know what I mean? So I just have to let them be. And the time of observation is different than other kinds of time. And that's the sort of time I want to employ in my work. And you know, when you're confronted with an image of a northern white rhino, I mean, I hope you're fascinated. You know, and I hope you take the time to spend and look at that. Thank you. No, go ahead. Well, one question I have for you. Um, do you think that immersive installations or site-specific installations that really have an environmental um, component to it is something that is more needed in, uh, in a world where um, a lack of attention span is kind of you know, becoming a regular disease? Do you think that is something that uh, is developing out of our time a need that is rooted in our time? 
I mean, I, I think in some sense the answer is yes, but there's also a problem with that as well, which is the, you know, design by committee, thing, you know, the, the thing that has to go into and in all of the um, layers of time that uh, it takes to actually pull one of these things off. Like, you know, I, I'm working on this thing, it will be like five or six years before the station opens, you know, so by the time the station opens, I will have perhaps moved on from that idea. So I think that to have a practice that, um, you know, is like always involved with that, that would really take a lot to not have um, immediate, more immediate results, you know. Um, but yeah, I think that it's really great when you can um, interact with work in that way, you know, that's outside and so on. Yeah, I mean, I think in your question, you know, in a world where we have a decrease in attention span, do we need to grab people with more immersive things? I think, I, I, I think maybe I tend to go in the opposite direction and say like, I want things to be so simple and so kind quiet. of quiet mm -hmm. um, that that's where I'm looking for that pause in the difference from mm -hmm. that maybe kind of this immersive, the future of AI and all of these things, you know, um, but still to be able to have a relationship to that or a commentary or, you know, I'm not trying to make work that is disconnected from the world, but that maybe counters in this, this again, this pause, this slowness, the slowing down. Kind of aspect. But also maybe work that could be affected, let's say, by different weather conditions and light conditions if it was like out in, in a public realm that, um, that was changing weather-wise. You know, I, I think that's actually more what I meant about it being outside, okay. but yeah. Do you think of your work as a language, Sarah? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do, mm -hmm. especially with the paintings and then the paintings morphing into the works on site. But I think that um, there's something really positive about the accessibility with immersive work. Uh, you can bring in people who don't have art history backgrounds and children, and it, it's very wide ranging. However, there's also a trendy part to it where every VIP lounge wants an installation mm. now, which I think is a big problem. Anyone else? Yes? Thanks for coming up. Hello. Okay. <laughs> this isn't an original question. I was just really interested in, Fran, your answer, um, the tinkering in the studio and sort of letting inspiration come out of the physical rearrangement. It's really like a, it resonates with me. It has really deep meaning, I think, in some ways. And I was kind of hoping I could get some kind of answer from all three of you about daily practices or things you do when you feel blocked or like you have no inspiration. Um, I too was responding to the tinkering. I was like, oh yeah, that is the best time. You know, and it's when um, either when there is no deadline looming and I'm just kind of trying to find that inspiration or, I, you know, I often find myself going, doing really simple things. And for this last show, um, about two years ago, I wasn't sure what to do. So I just like dumped out all these like balsa sticks and some glue and I spent a couple months like every day I would come in and make two or three stick things with glue and wood and it was like the, the best so that I didn't have a goal and then I learned something from that that is very much a part of what how this installation got made so you just never know and I would just add to the tinkering thing that, you know, if let's say you're having a block that, um, that a daily practice is really, really super important. So even if it's just putting one little mark on a page or something, um, seriously, like that is okay just to be able to um, have something that uh, you know what it is you're 
doing. And then eventually that mark will look kind of interesting to you in five days or so. But seriously, like just building something up, um, you know, over time or, you know, um, research is something too that is interesting and having more than one project at one time because I mean for me I hit a lot of dead ends all the time and so um, being able to grasp at something else that maybe is um, is a path that you didn't intend on taking. Oh, sure. Um, I'm jealous because <laughs> I'm not a tinkerer and I wish that I were because then I would have something to do all day other than make phone calls <laughs> and ask people like, you know, do you know anyone who works with camels? <laughs> like that's my whole life is, tr is research and trying to find the things I need to make my work. And I would, I've always been jealous of like the Fishley and Vice sculptures where they made these studio sculptures. They would just go in the studio and they would make one every day with stuff that was in the studio. And I always loved that. And my husband works that way. And I'm jealous because I wish I could. I'm, but I'm not, I'm not a hand, I can't do things with my hands really. I'm not good at it. <laughs> How about you, Sarah? Um, I totally, when you were saying that, I was like, yes, that's the best state in the world. No deadlines and tinkering. Um, but I think it's important. I go on walks a lot. I look at things. Um, I also try to like see a human once a day, which I don't know, it might be a luxury problem, but that's <laughs> important to me. Any other questions? Yeah, if there's no other questions, then um, I thank everyone for being here. And of course, we're still here, you know, if you want to talk to any one of us, one-on-one, -on -one, we're here. And um, the book is in the store, it's so beautifully displayed. Christy, thank you for that. On these amazing pedestals that Christy actually helped make. Uh, uh, I'm so impressed by that. And um, yeah, say hi, and thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks. And thanks to the panelists, of course. Yeah. <laughs>